Live from the Bob Levy Broadcast Center, overlooking the Tom's River, it's time to get up, get out, do something. Wake up with Jeremy Grunin. Be a part of the show, 732-505-1160. News Talk Radio, WOBM AM 1160 and 1310. Listen online at WOBMAM.com. Hey, welcome back. Wake up with Jeremy Grunin. 707, Tuesday, July 26, 73 degrees. Got up to 95 today. WOBMAM 1160 and 1310. News Talk Radio streaming live on the radio pop app at WOBMAM.com. 732-505-1160. Join the conversation. We are now joined in studio by Bill Bresnan. Great to be here, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Uh, you sound like you're doing the disclaimer after an advertisement for something. I, I try. I, 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 well, that's see, it's funny you said that because eventually I'm going to sneak some things in there and people mm-hmm. won't even know. Of course not. And there we go. So, Bill, you know, you've been uh, you've been you've been making your way around the WOBM AM studios for the last couple of weeks. Uh, preferred company, Luz Katigna. Uh, and you know, I know this is uh, not like your old stomping grounds at at uh, at, at ABC, right? Uh, Seventy seven. Actually, these studios are much nicer. Your uh, studios are brand new. Well, and you've got state of the art equipment all over the place. And we were kind of going the other way before building new stuff. Nice. Well, I think that it's easy for folks to lose sight with your with your voluminous uh, history, career, amount that you've done. Uh, you know, both in media. Uh, and uh, and in the financial world, I think it's it's easy for people to lose sight of what your primary objective is. So why don't you tell folks a little bit about about what you do? Well, actually, I started talk radio uh, after spending twenty odd years on Wall Street. I began my career on Wall Street as a teenager. I was working for E. F. Hutton and Company, the old E. F. Hutton. When he speaks, people listen. Edward Hutton was alive yeah. when I was there. Actually, uh, interesting man. Self-made man had this gigantic 300 and some odd foot long steel sailing yacht. And he knew every single person who worked for his company. And I started at 15 as a summer kid from January, June rather, until September. And every year thereafter through college, they put me through everything you can imagine. The commodity section, the floor of the exchanges and uh, trading and all the rest of it. So that I was steeped in the business. Over the 20 years I spent on the street... I wound up finally at the end, the director of corporate finance and investment banking for a member firm, and we were doing public offerings, what people know of as IPOs. They were mainly uh, for uh, the development, really, of uh, commercial properties. We were building shopping centers and we were building uh, office buildings and things like that with the money. So in 1981, the end of 1981, I was doing seminars teaching our clients all about how to invest and how to be smarter in what they were doing and be knowledgeable about the world of personal finance. And at one of those seminars, who walks in the door but a gentleman who was a very early, early talk radio personality from Philadelphia, John Scheuer. John Scheuer was a contemporary of Bernie Meltzer back then. They were both financial guys, came up here from Philadelphia, commuted literally. And at one of the seminars I was doing, John Scheuer said, I'd like you to come on my radio show on WMCA, the uh, good guy radio. Right. So I went on there and I was talking about small companies raising money and was sitting in a studio smaller than this one. John Scheuer was one of these chain smokers and I've never smoked in my life. So I'm sitting there in a cloud of blue smoke. Nice. And about 15 minutes into the show, he gets up and he walks out the door. And I said, well, he must be going to the bathroom or something. And I continued to talk. At the bottom of the hour, the engineer in the control room said, pick up a couple of those scripts in front of you and read them. So I read them. And... We finished, I finished talking, and John didn't come back. And I asked the engineer, I said, where's John? I said, well, John went home. What am I supposed to do? He said, just keep doing. We're going to start taking calls from the listeners about money, and I want you to keep doing it. So for the next hour and a half, never having been on the radio before, never having had any radio experience, I started doing basically a seminar on the air. Right. And at the end of the hour, uh, two hours rather, the people at uh, WMCA said, well, you know, we really like you, you have a radio voice, and if John gets sick, if John dies, we're gonna call you and you're gonna do the show. I said, thank you. Didn't hear a word from him for six months. Six months later, I happened to be in the Midtown area doing another seminar, and MCA was right there, so I went up to the studios and I said, well, what are you doing? And they said, oh, the second John dies, the second John this, you're it. I get in the elevator, and there were two guys in the elevator whose faces to this day I wish I could see. They were facing the door, and they were saying, you know, WABC is going to give up music. No more Cousin Brucey, and we're going to go talk. So I went home. I found the tape I had made of the John Scheuer program. I wrapped it up in a letter. I wrote a three-line note. I understand you're going talk. 
you'll want a financial guy, I'm it. And I mailed it in. No dossier, no background, no right. anything. I got called by the program director, a fellow named uh, Jay Clark, who was making the conversion from uh, music to talk. And I go to his office, and it's one of these gigantic corner offices with dossiers and videos and equipment all over the place having to do with the real radio personalities who they were considering for this whole new format of advice radio. They had a psychologist and a plant person and everybody else. Joy Brown did psychology and so on. And there's my little dossier and my tape in front of him. And he asks me, he said, Bill, what would you do if we put you on the radio and you didn't have a caller for an hour? I said, I'd keep talking. How about two hours? I'd keep talking. What about three hours? That's about the time it takes me to clear my throat, so that's not a problem. We'll just keep going. Okay, thank you very much, and I left. Didn't hear from them for a few weeks. We're down in Florida with the kids on vacation, wandering around Disney World, and we're at the hotel, and I get a call from WABC. Will you come up and do the show on Monday? I said, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm on vacation with my children. And they hung up. And I said to my wife, there it was. There was my chance. I blew it. We're in a plane going home, and she said, you know, you didn't have it before, you don't have it now, but I have a feeling you're going to hear from them. And lo and behold, we get home, and there's a note, come back to ABC. So I go to the studios, and now the program director has nothing on his desk except my tape and my letter. And he said, Bill, I have good news for you and bad news for you. I said, look, I've spent my life in the financial community. Good news takes care of itself. What's the bad news? He said, the bad news is we are not giving you one of our shows. (laughs) So I started to get up and pick up my tape. He said, don't you want to hear the good news? I said, all right, go ahead. He said, the good news is we're going to give you both shows. You're going to be on the weekday, every day, and you're going to be on the weekend. Thank you very much. That was, Jeremy, exactly 5,421 broadcasts ago. Wow. Wow. So I've been on the air for 14,228 hours talking about money. And the evolution of the way I've been talking about it is what is most amazing. Because when I started talking about money, even while I was on the street, it was a different financial world. We right. were We had a totally different economy. People actually had real money then, and they weren't buried in debt up to their eyeballs where they couldn't function. The nation was prospering. People had jobs, and all those things that we don't have today existed then. As a matter of fact, when I was telling people then about a, an emergency reserve fund, right. you know, the money in the underwear drawer, I told them, you know, if you have a month's gross expenses, that's plenty. You know, today I'm suggesting that people have a year's gross expenses. Right. Uh, Bill, I'm going to try to get control of this interview back again here. So it's here we go. Your program. Number go one. <laughs> number one. Uh, so are you ever, do you ever look back and say, if I, if you hadn't gone down the radio, uh, the whole radio deal, you could have been the next Gordon Gecko? Uh, possibly, yes. Yes. We had the ability to do what Gordon Gecko did. Right. But fortunately, I didn't go that route because the majority of those people, as you know, are in jail. Yes. Just as the majority of financial talk show hosts have gone to jail. Right. But when they get out, they close out their Swiss bank account and they're still in good shape. <laughs> exactly. I'm just saying. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, and the, the next question is, have, I, have you ever been told that you have, uh, and probably not, but have you ever been told that there's a, there's a similarity in your speaking patterns to Bernie Sanders? No. You no, haven't heard that no. before. No. The only thing I've been told by people is that I have the perfect face for radio, number uh, one. Uh, we all hear that. That I mean, we hear all the time. And you're a way better looking man than I am. <laughs> Thank you. But the other thing is... No, you're, I, you're supposed to say, no, no, I'm not. No, no. You're, well, but that's, you're the host. I'll, well, I will bow to you, the host. <laughs> <laughs> but I've done, about, uh, I've done about 450 public seminars where we lecture about money, and I have never once had a person come up to me and say, Bill, you look exactly the way you sound on the radio. Right. I'm older on the air. I've got more hair on the air, you know, all those things. Yeah. But uh, would I have done the same thing? I probably would have stayed on the street. Yep. Uh, would have maintained a position on the floor. I was on the yeah. floor of the New York Stock Exchange and retired from there. Yeah. Oh, I mean, so so if you think about it, when you were when you first got involved in the early '80s, right? I mean, if you look at where the stock market has gone now over the last 35 mm-hmm. years, uh, there, you know, there is no, there was no better investment in the world. You would have had about an eight percent average return over those uh, yeah. year, over those years if you had just gone in. Well, look at people. If, if you just bought, bought you know, large cap, yeah. if you just bought large cap, you know, or if you just stocks, bought McDonald's, that's you know, it. You bought McDonald's and reinvested the dividends. You would have millions and millions of dollars. But people don't do that. That's the problem. People are greedy. That's one of the big ingredients in financial planning that has to be removed because that's when you get hurt. And the other thing about 
the greed is, is that people hold on to rather than let go of. Right. Well, so let's stop it right there. We're going to put a little a little a line in the sand because you've created a teaser for us. Uh, so when we come back, I want you to talk about that. I want you to talk about how we fight that uh, quote unquote greed, right? And what the right strategy is, especially for those uh, that may be uh, you know, uh, well, let me say, playing the back nine. <laughs> Wake up with Jeremy Grunin with Bill Bresden back after the break. Everything you need to know about the Jersey Shore. This is Wake Up with Jeremy Grunin. News Talk Radio, WOBM AM 1160 and 1310. Hey, welcome back. Wake up with Jeremy Grunin. We are here with Bill Bresden. And we were talking uh, a little bit about uh, greed. And we were talking a little bit about uh, you know, there's there's a little bit of a mentality, I think, to hold on to every last shekel that you have. So why don't you talk to us about that strategically? Let me tell you where it came from to begin with. I had a person who used to listen to me for years and years and years and years and years. And, and years. She, I'm sorry? And years. And years, yeah. yes. She was up in her 80s, and she would cry. She would say, oh, Bill, I've never been to Paris. I've never had a nice vacation. She was a widow. And I said to her, look... You've got $800,000 in CDs and money market accounts and treasuries and municipal bonds. You're 80 years old. You cannot take it with you. you got to spend it. She said, oh, but Bill, you don't remember the Depression. I said, no, thank God I wasn't alive then. Right. I said, but I do remember the stories of my dear Aunt Dot, who listened to every program I ever did. She said to me, Bill, Billy, my Aunt Dot called me Billy, of course. She said, you never had your nose to the window of a bakery and couldn't get a piece of that cake. I did. That's why I've got $100,000 in my checking account so that I can do whatever I like. Well, that uh, mentality, unfortunately, is hurting an awful lot of people. First of all, let's take the state of New Jersey, for example. If you keep it because you're so greedy, you're going to die with it, and death taxes and federal estate taxes and all the expenses at the end of life are going to eat it up, and it ain't going to go where you want it to go. So what I did was I started looking around and said, well, what is the answer to this? Where do you put it? What do you do with it so you can literally eat the cake and it's still sitting on the plate? And the result was give it away. And give it away while you're alive. How much do you give away? That's another story. That depends on the individual and depends on your goals and objectives. So let's take a simple person giving it away. Somebody who lives down here in Ocean County, they've got a home. They own it probably outright. They've got a whole bunch of junk in the house, which they have no idea what it's worth, but it's worth a lot. They've got an IRA, a 401k, a 403b, some form of tax-deferred programs filled with money. And they probably have seven, dollars $800,000, maybe even a million. But they're going around looking for two-for-one coupons at the restaurants. You know, they're buying a cheaper car than they should have. They're not putting any air conditioning on when it's 95 degrees the way it's been all week. And they're still stuck in that mentality. So you got to show them that... You're better off giving it away than keeping it. So now you're accomplishing two things. Their altruism, if they have any, but also their greed. What we did was to make this happen was we found a a hospital up in Bergen County. The hospital foundation was looking for money. We took as our first quote-unquote test case a woman, a widow lady, who had bought her house with her husband up in Bergen County for $25,000. She raised her family in it. She educated her kids. She did all these things, and the house is now $600,000. Now, of course, selling a house for $600,000, if you're a widow, you only get a $250,000 exclusion on the gain. The rest right. of it would get taxed. Right. If you die with it, it's going to be decimated. Yep. And she still wanted to live there because these were all of her bosom buddies. So what does she do to overcome all the problems of greed, taxes, estate, and everything else? We had her give the house to the hospital as a gift. The hospital is a not-for-profit organization. The IRS has allowed them to have that status, just as millions, well, a million, I think it's a million, 100,000 foundations are around. Anyway, they gave her back, and this is where the other side of it comes from. What do you get by giving? They gave her back, first of all, the life estate. She could live in the house for the rest of her life. Right. And all she had to pay was her utilities and her cable television. The, The hospital owned the house. Right. But the problem then became... What can she do with all of her tax-deferred money? Well, she's got a charitable contribution deduction. The charitable contribution deduction can be used to offset up to 50% of adjusted gross income. So she starts now withdrawing massive amounts of money from all of her tax-deferred accounts, which otherwise would have been taxed as ordinary income or would have been part of her estate and decimated again. 
She takes that money and invests it either tax-free or gives it away to her children now while she's alive. Right. If she's worried about the kids squandering it, she sets up trusts with all the various provisions that a trust has. But the key is, does the not-for-profit give her back what she needs? The life estate is one thing. She could also get back from the foundation an annuity so she could have increased income. Right. If she's worried about the kids, or the kids, I should say, are worried about their inheritance, the foundation can set up a life insurance trust. In the trust, put a policy on her, which gives the kids as the beneficiaries right. a tax-free bundle of cash. They can buy the house back if they want it. Sure. Or the foundation sells it at a profit. that They're not going to be taxed if they sell it. Now, where did this come from? 137 people who signed a giving pledge. Very Pe- nice. So, Bill, I, I got to stop you there because that music means we're up against it. But it's that kind of strategy. That's the kind of thing we're going to finish up talking with Bill Bresden when we get back. And we're going to give him his magic wand. Wake up with Jeremy Grunin back after this. Wake up with Jeremy Grunin. News Talk Radio, WOBM AM 1160 and 1310. Live from Town Square Towers at the heart of the Jersey Shore, wake up with Jeremy Grunin. Get up, get out, do something. Join the conversation, 732-505-1160. News Talk Radio, WOBM AM 1160 and 1310. Listen online at WOBMAM.com. Welcome back. Wake up with Jeremy Grunin, 733, Tuesday, July 26, 73 degrees, getting up to 95 today. We're going to be schwitzing. WOBMAM 1160 and 1310 News Talk Radio, streaming live on the Radio Pup app and WOBMAM.com, 732-505-1160, talking to Bill Bresden. And uh, Bill, so do you want to, do you, what? what are you laughing at? The way you said you were going to slip in something in that rapid, rapid conversation, yeah. like, you know, if you call my number, you can have $1,000 tomorrow. Everybody will miss that. <laughs> it's like a disclaimer. It sounds like a disclaimer. That's right. You know. uh, so so tell me, uh, so so do you want to finish up the story about our, our little old lady from Pasadena? Who gave, little, who gave everything to Bergen, uh, our, Bergen County College. Our little old lady gave it to the hospital, but the Pascag Valley Hospital up in, uh, in Bergen County, and she wound up doing everything that we wanted her to do. She avoided all the taxes. She didn't evade them, everybody. There's a difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. She avoided all the taxes. She stayed in her neighborhood. She divested herself of everything. She had more money than she knew what to do with because all this money coming out of her tax-deferred accounts she could spend or give to her children. And she was able to stay with her crones in the neighborhood where she was for the last 25 or 30 years as a widow. Right. So we were able to accomplish all of those things in one fell swoop. And if she couldn't have done it through the hospital or through a college or through a synagogue or through a church, the tax laws are such that she could have set up her own family foundation to do exactly the same thing. And it was all a matter of getting herself an attorney, paying a few fees, convincing the IRS that everything she's doing is for the benefit of the country, and do exactly what a million one hundred thousand other entities do by having that foundation. Now that's one of the ways to do it. And the reason I'm saying this is to couple your independence with your wealth. Because right now we are living in an era of total dependence with a nation that is already in technical bankruptcy right. and a state which is already in technical bankruptcy. The federal government only talks about the $19 trillion of the national debt. They never talk about the unfunded debt, which is 10 times that, which is never going to be repaid and can never be repaid. Right. Notice you never hear a politician say we're going to pay back or we're going to reduce debt because they can't. Right. The federal government right now, the Treasury Department and all the rest of it, is really the biggest Ponzi scheme extent. <laughs> That's all it is. And it's got to be said. There's no way we can tax ourselves to death. We could pay 100% of what we make in taxes and get nowhere. Right. We, we could have double-digit growth in the gross domestic product for the next 20 years and we'd never get anywhere. Yeah, that's why I think we need to keep building the military up. Because you know, I, if you can't if you can't pay off the debt, you might as well just have the biggest uh, the but, biggest military. But have it at home. Have, that's right. Have your wealth at home. And let's take this area for example. When we had the storm, all the electronics went out. People couldn't go to an ATM. They couldn't buy food. They couldn't buy anything. So what did they do? If they had it, they went to their dresser drawer and they pulled out fifty dollar bills and they could do whatever they want. 
And I hope next to those fifty dollar bills, they have a Glock and a couple of clips. <laughs> so, and uh, I just I want I have to I'd be remiss if I didn't point out uh, <laughs> that uh, that a year ago, a year and a half ago now, mm-hmm. you had this. Uh, we had this article in the Asbury Park Press. Yes, we did. Right mm-hmm. where you and uh, you you and your wife Kirsten. Right. Yes. Uh, that you had penned more than ten thousand love letters to her. Yes. One each night of your marriage. Every single day, she gets a card or a letter from me, and has for decades because I happen to be madly in love with her. Number one, and number two, I believe that the best way to keep a marriage going is communication, and especially communication of how you feel. And since I am so madly in love with her, I tell her that in writing as well as verbally every single day. And those cards became something of a, uh, I guess, an event, if you will. Because if she goes away, for example, let's say she was in her Florida to visit her uh, relatives and I was here, I would mail the cards in advance so she'd get them in her in-laws or her parents, in that case, in their letterboxes. Or I stick one under the pillow. Or sometimes if I can't get to the store, I will actually create a card. And, you know, I said, funny, I sent a letter to the people at Hallmark. They didn't even answer me. (laughs) I said, you know, know, I'm one of your biggest customers. And they just totally ignored me. (laughs) But no, it's a, it's a, an expression of love, and it's something that I believe makes for a solid marriage. Well, I'll tell you what: if you married married as long as you have been, I <laughs> guess uh, I guess uh, props to you. Uh, and uh, you know, I I have written. Uh, I think my wife just texted me. She said, "In our in our uh, seventeen, uh, seven, I see, I'm not going to get the Ooh, number of years now you're right. in trouble. In our sixteen years of marriage, <laughs> uh-huh. um, I have written over ten. Over ten, 10 cards, ten. yeah. So I'm, I'm right there with you. We're 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 moving up. Um, Bill Bristol, it's that time of the show. That time where we give you the magic wand, the fairy dust, the pixie dust, the ability just to wiggle your nose and to make an impact. Bill Bresden, what are you going to do for the world? What are you going to do if you could just kind of make it happen? If I could make it happen, the way I would make it happen would be to become a benevolent dictator for one year, to be left alone, not to be hampered by the media bending every word that I say or the press saying I meant this and I didn't mean that or special interest groups squeezing me in every direction. You know, the Roman Empire saved itself at one point, briefly, by allowing someone to become a benevolent dictator, to clean house, as it were, and to go forward where instead of being buried alive in litigation or buried alive by political uh, pressure, you're able to get things done. And we've got to, in this country, we've got to get things done. We're spending much too much time fooling around. And uh, I think that would be what I would do is my wave my magic wand or wiggle my nose as the witch did on television and make me benevolent dictator for one year. What do you think? So to that point, you know, I, I have become a big fan now ever since uh, uh, since since we uh, we're meeting our vice presidential candidates. Um, I am a big fan of this whole one term as governor thing. Uh, And I I like the one term as president thing, too. Like, it's four years. Do what's right. Do what's in your conscience. I mean, I think that they're – I I think term limits are so huge to to having – instead of having career politicians – why not have people who make career, you know, who, who take a who take a hiatus, take a few years to make a positive impact on the world and do what's the right thing in their conscience? Our what do you think Our founding fathers did exactly that. I mean, it makes total sense. They came it? to work for the country, and they left, and they went back to tend their farms or their fields and whatnot, and they led normal lives again. They were, became part of the community. We have allowed this entrenched bureaucracy, and it's not just the ones you mentioned who need term limits. It's the entrenched bureaucracy that's been there for 20, 25, and 30 years who basically cannot be fired. Think about it. The best job in the world is government. You make more than your employer and you can't be fired. That's that's dead wrong. That you'll never have change if you can't do that. You've got to get these people out of there. And somebody comes to work and says, well, I'm only going to handle five cases today. If somebody sits next to them and handles six, they get fired. Yeah. We just have to get rid of that, and benevolent dictator can do that. Exactly. Well, like I always say, it's a mixed up, mumbled up, shook up world, except for Lola. Uh, <laughs> Bill Bresnan, uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. You are a fountain of, uh, of. I mean, I'm pretty sure that if we wanted to, we could have about eight hours of stories from you. Uh, if that you would like, be I'll be happy to come in- back. No, no, that wasn't an invitation. <laughs> I'm just saying we could. Thank you so much for your time this morning, sir. Great and, to be uh, here, And we'll Jeremy. have you on again soon, okay? Thank you. Love w- it. Wake up with Jeremy Grunin back after this.